When an infectious disease reaches crisis proportions, how can a country return to daily life and restore its economy? Countries like New Zealand and South Korea that deployed robust public health measures early on were able to return to work, school, and recreational activities far more quickly than the United States. We can learn from their successes. Before a vaccine is widely available, stopping the spread depends on a four-step strategy. One, widespread use of masks to prevent disease transmission. Two, widely available testing with results reported quickly. This way, infections can be detected before they spread further. Three, large-scale contact tracing to determine who is infected or may become infected because they were exposed. Four, voluntary targeted isolation by those who test positive or who have been exposed. These combined actions can help stop a virus in its tracks. With targeted isolation, we can avoid a general lockdown. If people who know they are infected or have been exposed to someone who is, stay home for a period of time, the rest of the population can continue to go to work and school. Testing doesn't increase the number of people with a disease. It gives us vital information about who has the disease. Without testing, tracing, and isolation, attempts to reopen will be disrupted as the virus spikes. The economy can't take those ups and downs. In conjunction with testing, contact tracing allows us to track how a disease spreads. Contact tracers start by interviewing infected people and asking them to self-isolate. A contact tracer also identifies and alerts anyone the infected person recently interacted with, asking them to self-isolate as well. This method really works. Here's an example. Take an area of 100,000 people where testing is scarce and there's no contact tracing program. Without extensive testing, tracing, and self-isolation, after a month, we can assume about eight people a day are infected. After another month, about 90 people would be infected each day. But with ample testing and contact tracing in place, the scenario is very different. If people who tested positive were contacted and self-isolated, the rate would be closer to two new infections per day. After another month, only one person would be infected every two days. And then there are masks, the first line of defense. They are the simplest way for everyone to proactively prevent infections. Given the many variables that impact a mask's effectiveness, it's hard to quantify exactly how many people would be protected, but here's a reliable example. Imagine a school where everyone wears masks and sits six feet apart. Assume one person in that school has COVID-19. By wearing masks, it's very likely that no one else will catch it. But if everyone doesn't take those precautions, the infection spreads rapidly. Some feel that wearing masks, social distancing, and self-isolation infringe on their personal freedom. But consider similar rules we all follow to protect the public. We aren't free to shout fire in a theater. We aren't free to smoke in hospitals, planes, or restaurants. Because these things are not just personal choices, they expose others to danger. Our nation's founders demanded liberty, but they also said that liberty has limits. It ends when one person's actions harm others. Using these four essential tools, masks, testing, contact tracing, and targeted isolation, we can all make the choice to fight the virus, revive the economy, and protect our communities. Ultimately, working to contain a virus is in everyone's self-interest. For more information, please visit the Hastings Center online.